Welcome to Hot Flashes and Cool Topics, a podcast for women in midlife and beyond here at Hot Flashes and Cool Topics. We talk about anything and everything to do with midlife. My name is Colleen. My name is Bridget. Today we are welcoming Jean Chatsky, and that is a name that probably many of you remember because she has been on the NBC Today show for the last 25 years as their financial editor. She's also an ambassador for AARP. I remember her... Um, on the TV, watching in, you know, maybe my 30s or 40s, and listening to her financial advice, most of the time saying, I don't have enough money to put away (laughs) for savings, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it made sense. Like Mm -hmm. she spoke in terms that weren't, and she'll talk about her path to be, to this um, career. It wasn't a financial, um, financial planner path. It was more in journalism. So I think the way she spoke on TV just made more sense to me. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and I really appreciated her opinions and, and going out, you know, doing research for this episode, her website has great, her yes. has great resources on it. She's got a podcast, her money with Jean mm-hmm. Chatsky and just all the advice she's now giving to the Gen Xers and the boomers that can really help us in our, inv- in our investments and our retirement. Right. Bridget, Bridget's yeah. not going to tell you a little bit more uh, about her. But. Oh, yeah. Well, I read her book, Women with Money, and it says The Judgment Free Guide to Creating the Joyful, Less Stressed, Purposeful, and Yes, Rich Life That You Deserve. And it covers everything. So you'll hear us talk about that in the podcast. But it, it starts with, you know, when you're younger, when you're getting out of school, all the way up to what to do with aging parents, what to do with yourself. Um, estate planning, just every step of the way of your life. And also it, it has other situations with other women getting together and talking about money, which was always so taboo. We were all mm-hmm. brought up not to talk about money. You never ask people, how, which I still think is pretty rude. <laughs> don't right. ask people don't how much they, much they make. Yeah, it's a different, it's, it's, there's this line where if you want to be in this certain career, maybe look at a survey or something like that. Um, right. Look at statistics. But it it but, should be more commonplace to be able to sit down and talk about, okay, well, what's your investment strategy? You right. don't have to talk numbers. You don't have but, to say how much. Just right. Or do you, you have a great money market account that you could recommend? Right. Or how much percentage wise are you putting away? And Jean does talk about kind of her bullet points for investment, which were really helpful. They are very helpful. They are mathematical. So I had to write them down and figure it out (laughs) But It was was great that she told that. And the 15%, and I know that, you know, at certain times in my life, just like Colleen said in hers, when I was in my early thirties, late twenties and raising children and paying, you know, tuition to private schools or, or just paying for food. Who knows? You know, <laughs> I mean, there was a time when John and I, we, my, our son was four months old and we moved to Pittsburgh and I quit my job. He got a, he got transferred. So mm-hmm. he did get a raise, but his raise wasn't enough to take care of my job. Right. So it was like, we sold a car. Like we were one vehicle family. They had public transportation, just things that you do. And I remember thinking at that time, how are we going to put any other money in our savings account? 15% sounded 15% like, like a hundred percent. Yeah. Yes. I mean, we did, we always made sure we contributed to 401k programs and retirement programs, which is so nice because that just comes out and you just don't even see it, which is great. We all know that, but I always found automatic ways of paying yourself right. or putting into savings accounts for, or really for savings. For yes, savings. for savings is great, but just you need to go to her website, hermoney.com, mm-hmm. and and like Colleen said, listen to her podcast as well. I mean, they will cover all kinds of things. I was listening to today's podcast, and they have uh, listener questions. And there right, was they really, do that on a lot yes, of episodes, yeah. they do, and there was one that I had never heard of this program. This girl wrote in and said, um, I always got savings bonds as a child. And now that I'm paying student loans, boy, do I appreciate those little savings bonds. What can I do to help my niece or nephew or godchild or child now? Like, you know, maybe savings bonds aren't going to make the most money. It's still nice, but, but you could maybe contribute to the child's 529B if they don't have one, ask their parents if they'd like one started, um, 
which is their savings for college, but it doesn't have to be college. It could be a trade school. It could be, right. a, yeah, it could be any kind of education, further and, education. You know, it's, it's interesting too, because back when I was in my twenties and thirties, we were just trying to survive for the month, like month to yes. month. And yes. the idea of putting away, um, a 401k. I mean, that really for us didn't even become an issue until well later, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but had somebody just automatically taken it out as they can do now, I think that really helps the younger generation. I know I talk more about to my kids about you have great health insurance at this job. You have a 401k plan. We never talked about that when we were in our twenties. That just wasn't, but now it is. So it's, it's, and that's a good thing. Right. That's a good thing that we, yeah, like that was something we talked to our children. And it's so neat now, Mm -hmm. if you're lucky enough to be employed anywhere. I mean, when my son first got out of college, he worked at Toys R Us. They had, which is now gone, (laughs) but Mm -hmm. but they had, they had a 401k plan at Toys R Us. They had, um, I think where he works now, he can get insurance at a restaurant, which is fabulous that he is. And they should take that. advantage of it because yes. I don't think 20, 30 years ago, we thought in those terms and it's much oh, more talked about now, which is yes. great. Yeah. So that all the, the whole things, you know, the, the things about being under, um, underpaid for your work, yes. things like under that, earning, yeah. under earning, I, I mean, things that I, well, in the profession I was in, you know, I was right. definitely underpaid. We'll talk about that. <laughs> but yes, but it, it is just a really um, great way to find out what to do with your money because it is so important. Yes. Um, that and safety was such a big thing. She'll bring that yeah, up. She'll Women bring that up. want to feel so, safe, yeah. mm-hmm. especially in our demographic. Yes. Um, yes. So, so she'll also talk about what to do if you become single at this stage of life and things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to let her do the talk. So here we go. Welcome back to Hot Flashes and Cool Topics, everybody. Mm -hmm. We are welcoming Jean Chatsky, who has been the financial editor of NBC's Today Show for the last 25 years and really has given amazing advice over these years about how to realistically handle money and how to save. So welcome, Jean, to the show. Thanks, Colleen. It's nice to be here. Hi, Bridget. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. And we will talk about all kinds of aspects yes. <laughs> of, of your thing. I was like ready to jump in on the book, but Colleen, we'll, we'll get started too on her, her story. Um, well, that's what I kind of want. Yeah. I wanted to talk to you uh, just about how you got started in because fi- you aren't the typical financial advisor story. You're more of a journalist. So could you talk a little bit about how you made your way into this field? Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. I learned I'm not a financial advisor at all. Um, I am a financial writer and a financial journalist, and I learned about money in my day job, which was to report and write about things that were financial. Um, I I uh, I was an English major in in college. I, I did have a, a knack for math. I was pretty good at it in high school and I liked learning about how numbers can sort of tell a story and that was appealing to me. But I just, I found my way into business journalism, quite frankly, because that's the job I got. Um, And then I discovered that I really, really liked it, that I wanted to do more of it. And I carved a path for myself um, through a number of personal finance magazines. I mean, you name it, I probably worked there. Um, Forbes and and Money and Fortune. I wrote, I didn't work there, but I wrote for them and Smart Money. Um, And along the way, I started uh, appearing on television. And um, I was at Smart Money Magazine at the time. I was writing a lot of stuff about real people and their real money, all the sort of topics that we now cover at Her Money, saving and investing and smart spending and making sure you've got a plan in place to protect your money and taking care of your family and your kids and relationships. And uh, they started inviting us to be on television. So I I did a stint for a while on the local early morning today in New York show for a few years. I did that once a week for a few years. And then I got picked up on, on the today show. And, um, and that opened so many different doors. I mean, and that's, 
it's just interesting because you didn't start with a degree in finance and go, and I think that helps because it's, it humanizes kind of the conversation. Yeah. I think, <laughs> look, if you guys were my therapist, you might say um, that I um, was trying to fix a problem in my own life. Right. I mean, um, I was a bit of a financial mess. Um, coming out of college. I wasn't, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to do it. I certainly wasn't doing the right things. But in learning about my money on the job, I was able to improve that aspect of my own life and gain confidence. And, um, and I discovered it's not all that hard. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, there's not, there, the industry makes it so much more complicated than it has to be. And so I had to understand these things for myself before I could A, write about them and B, explain them to other people. And the luxury of having my job meant that I could call the smartest people on the planet at universities and at think tanks and in, at, on Wall Street and, and, I, and they would talk to me. Mm -hmm. about wow. all of these different things. And I could just take in that information and figure out, okay, let's make this make sense in English. And, and that's how I think my career grew. Yeah, I, because it can be so intimidating. If it's not in a language that you can understand, it's very intimidating. And then you, you just kind of walk away from it. Yeah, and here's mm -hmm. one of the things like about being a journalist we're paid to ask questions, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of people, particularly a lot of women, shy away from managing their money as much as we should because we feel like, oh, I can't ask that question. That's such a dumb question. You know, I'm paid to ask the dumb questions. Mm -hmm. um, and and as, But as a result, I no longer believe that there are any dumb questions, right? I'm going to, if you can't explain it to me in English, there is something wrong with you, not wrong with me. Mm -hmm. I love that. <laughs> that is great. And I mean, that, that uh, is one of the things when you also went back to saying out of college, you didn't know what you were doing. And I think we all were in college, all three of us around the same time, where they were throwing credit cards at you. Oh yeah. As you walked across campus and uh, you know you're 19 years old and they're offering you this credit card. Free you like, think free money. Yeah. <laughs> well you I do. Mean, I mean that's yeah. how I got mine. I got I got a um 2 pound bag of M&Ms for signing yeah, up for like my first credit card. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You're in college you're like food. I'll take anything. Uh -huh. and, exactly. But yeah, and you don't understand the whole uh, involvement of the interest rate and how long it's going to take you to pay this thing off. And, you know, you can't mm -hmm. just go buy a $3,000 handbag or whatever on this credit card that's when you're making $15,000 a year or whatever it was at the time. Uh, so those things are so important. And that's what I like about your podcast and your book and your most recent book, which we'll talk about more in a little bit, but because it, it, touches not only on mid midlife women, but it touches on all women through all walks of their lives. So that was something that I really liked about your book. I want to get one for my daughter, for my nieces, <laughs> you know. So, you know, and yeah. actually you, you've written several books, but the most recent book is Women and Money. So mm -hmm. you specifically talk about women and our finances. And like you said before, there are there's a certain generation, I think being Generation X, we're kind of at the end of that where women didn't talk about money. Women didn't know how to write a check. And I know millennials are like, what's a check? But right. you know, they, didn't, they didn't know how to balance a checkbook and things like that. Women now, and I have two daughters, Bridget has a daughter. We're making sure they understand finances. Like we want you in control of your own money. So it's great that you are kind of bringing us along with that, the 45 and up crowd. With your book, Bridget loved it, by the way. She's, Thanks. I did, yes. What were you trying to get across with this newest book, With Women and Money? So what I've learned, and, and I'm going to um, just correct you, because if anybody wants to go get the book, um, they should know it's Women with Money. With oh, I'm um, sorry. Women no, that's with totally women. fine. Susie Orman wrote a book called Women and Money, and I oh, just don't oh, want yeah. anybody to buy the wrong one. Yeah, um, okay. <laughs> so with, okay. Women with Money. With Women money. with Money. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote it because one of the things 
I've just learned in, in starting her money, but also being in this field for such a long time, that women are really different where our money is concerned, which means to try to apply the same strategies that we apply um, uh, to men often doesn't work. And I wrote the book for the same reason that I started hermoney.com. Sometimes we need an environment. We need a place where we feel safe having these conversations. We need a place where we feel safe learning this information. And the information that we want to learn because our goals are different is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I started this project, I just went out and asked hundreds of people what they wanted from their money, hundreds of women. Of all, of all ages. Her Money's audience is a little more broad than yours. We've got about a third millennials, a third Xers, and a third boomers. And, and so I wanted to cover the gamut. And what was interesting was that I learned very quickly that I was asking the wrong question because it's not really what we want from our money that we have to get first. It's what we need from our money. Mm -hmm. And for women, over and over and over, I heard this innate need for safety and security. Mm -hmm. I heard, I don't just want a house. I want a house with a paid off mortgage. And I don't just want a car. I want a car with blind spot indicators and backup cameras and every possible airbag. And I don't just want money in my 401k. I want savings in the bank. Mm -hmm. And the problem with this need for um, financial security, particularly when it comes to that cash in the bank, is that it can stand in the way of achieving financial success. Because mm -hmm. if you just look at what we're getting in terms of return on our money in the bank, we're getting nothing. Mm -hmm. um, we have to step up and embrace our inner investor. And that means understanding a little bit about who we are as individuals, as it relates to money. I mean, we all come into our adult lives with a lot of money baggage, um, not money, not baggage that we learn, just things that we uh, imbibed as we were growing up, you know, whatever was in the air, all that tension that, that was in the air, all of, you know, if there were fights around money, if there were struggles around money, that's all part of you. And if you haven't dealt with it, you better believe it's impacting the way that you are treating your money to this day. Mm -hmm. So you can't change it, but you can understand it and choose to take your life in another direction. And, and then you need to get yourself to step up and just invest money because if you're not investing, if you're not um, putting your money to work so that it's doing as much work as you are, um, you're not going to have enough for retirement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you were also, just the book, you covered so much of this in your book, but the emotional part of money, that was really eye-opening. And there is a section in her book where um, you talk about one family that the, the children didn't know that the father owned the Dairy Queen that mm -hmm. they went to because they thought it was shameful to talk or have money they didn't want them to know well and p.s in that family i mean they were raised going to garage sales right yeah. they they thought they had no money mm -hmm. and so as a result this now grown woman has a very difficult time spending any money on herself she's just a she's really a hoarder of mm -hmm. money mm -hmm. even though she has plenty of money and so mm -hmm. she had to understand her own story, the fact that um, even though there was plenty of money, clearly when she was growing up, um, she it was just drummed into her head, we don't waste it, we don't spend on things we don't actually need, that for her to gain some enjoyment of her life and to, look, I, I, I am very big on um, we, part of the reason that we earn money is to enjoy our lives, right? And, mm -hmm. and everybody gets to define that for themselves. And at Her Money, we don't judge. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are unable to enjoy it because you've got some baggage, you got to deal with it. And so that was a real eye-opening moment for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to deal with that. And then you also touched on the other woman that had saved really well and had a bad breakup. And yeah. then just 
yeah, she went through years and just spent this money that she had saved because of her emotions. She was so sad, you know, she was so and sad. Yeah. She was so sad. And it, it does feel sometimes sadness feels like this vast hole. And we think that we can throw money at the problem and solve it, which doesn't typically work. But hey, I've, you know, I have certainly had a bad day and taken myself shopping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Along those lines, how do you think the pandemic has affected people's investment and financial responsibilities? It's really, really interesting. Um, one of the things that we've seen through the pandemic is savings rates pop. Um, and in part, so there are a couple of things that, that factored into that. Um, in, in part, we weren't going anywhere. We weren't going out to eat. We weren't commuting. We weren't driving our cars. I mean, there's this, you know, the joke, you know, how many weeks does your car go on a tank of gas now? Um, so we were cooking. Um, and, and all of those things meant that we weren't spending as much money as we typically spend. Um, but we also had uh, some artificial money flowing into the system, the stimulus dollars, the extra unemployment payments. The, the, um, the savings rate has tapered off since, that, since the beginning of the pandemic, but we're still saving more than we were before we went into the pandemic. So typically, the savings rate in America, the, the, which is measured as, as a factor of your disposable income is about 6%. And it's hanging around in the mid-teens. Um, that's a lot of additional mm -hmm. money that we are saving. And mm -hmm. I think some people are just really, really frightened to, um, they, they want to make sure that they've got that fully flush emergency stash. It's been um, made very, very clear to them by this pandemic that an emergency cushion is not optional. It's, it's a must. Uh, mostly individuals have continued to um, maintain their investments in their retirement accounts. We have not seen a, 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 a rush for the exits. Mm -hmm. um, but we have seen a lot more volatility and I think people are nervous, particularly people our age mm -hmm. are, are very, very nervous about the markets. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think, I think it depends on how long this lasts, you know, yeah. wh whether, what, what will happen next year, what, whether the economy is really um, headed down. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that is all dependent on our health. Right. And, and the jobs people, yeah. you know, I was curious too about people who are now unemployed because of the pandemic, you know, are they, they're struggling, right? They're struggling. Yeah, they're struggling. I mean, they, the early on, there was a lot of talk that we were going to have a V shaped recovery. You know, we go right back up and then it was like a W we go down and up and down and up. And now what is pretty clear is that it's a K that, um, there is one Per, there's there's there are two groups of people. There's a group of people who are fortunate enough to be able to continue to do their jobs and get their paychecks from home. Um, they are not spending as much. They are saving more. They're doing fine. But then there are the people who've lost their jobs and lost their businesses, and they are um, and who are not receiving those additional supplemental employment unemployment payments anymore and for whom another stimulus check has not come um and they are they are truly struggling wow what would you say to someone in that lower part of the letter k that wanted to dip into their 401k or anything like that look sometimes you have to okay. i mean yeah. I, I i don't like the idea of dipping into your retirement account or pulling money out of your house or things like that but there, there. You you have to take care of your family, and you have to put food on the table. And so, if you're if you're dipping into your four hundred one k, I am assuming that you've done so after having really taken a hard look at your budget, cut it, cutting out all the non essentials, and then um, you know figuring out how little you can withdraw in order to just um, keep yourself going for a mm -hmm. while. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, I hope that. Uh, once we get through this election, we will have another stimulus package. I hope that it's targeted to the people who really need it. Mm -hmm. um, but, 
you know, this is not, this is not a time when, when we stand on, um, we haven't seen anything like this. Yeah. No. Yeah. I was curious if there was any, uh, any indicators of people doing that? Oh yeah. A there lot are. actually. Okay. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. So uh, my podcast, um, uh, her money is, is sponsored by Fidelity Investments. Mm -hmm. And I've done a, a couple of events recently um, with companies that have 401k plans um, with Fidelity. And they, it, people have seen a lot, there've been a lot of withdrawals. Um, and in part, because the CARES Act opened the door to withdraw up to $100,000 without penalty. Um, and then if you pay the money back over three years, within three years, um, you're not taxed on it. Like there's, there's no consequence. There's, okay. It's like an interest-free loan. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's um, definitely uh, greased the, the, um, the process a little bit. Okay. Yeah. I was curious about that. You know, also it's, it's great because as you mentioned, you do have a podcast for money and again, it's a free podcast. People can go on and they can get advice because you have some really great episodes, not Thanks. just about the pandemic, but there are some that talk about words of wisdom and people who are concerned or getting nervous, take a listen to the podcast because it's advice that is really beneficial and will help. Um, and, you know, I, I've listened to a couple over the last couple of days and, and you're, you're very honest about, you know, everyone makes mistakes when it comes to money. Uh, you just have to kind of learn as you go through the process. But one of the biggest takeaways you always talk about is not to spend more than you make. You have like five rules of things that you need to do to live comfortably. Can you talk about those five rules? Yeah, for sure. Um, this is one of those epiphanies that I had. I guess I had been doing this job for maybe 10, 15 years, and I realized everything that I was saying boiled down to these five things, and they haven't really changed. I've, I've held on to them. And so these are the things that you have to do consistently in order to have a comfortable financial life, you have to earn money. Um, you have, you know, there's no getting around that. You got to figure out some way to bring it in. Um, number two is you have to spend less than you make. And, and this is where people get into trouble, um, quite frankly, that we are not especially conscious of where our money goes. We, we think it goes to certain places, but it really doesn't. And it's so easy to spend um, these days. It's, you do it with a click, you do mm -hmm. it with a swipe. It's largely invisible. And so getting yourself, if, if that sounds like you, then, then tracking your spending can be a really helpful move, even if you do it just for a couple of weeks or a month. Um, third thing you do is take the money that you are not spending. And I like to see people get to a savings rate of 15% of their income. And that can include matching dollars from an employer and put it to work, mm -hmm. put it to work in your retirement accounts first, where you get some tax benefits, put it into 529 college savings accounts for the kids, put it into a discretionary account. Just, just make sure it's growing. Mm -hmm. um, the fourth thing is you have to uh, protect this financial world that you're building. And, and we do that with insurance. We do it with an emergency cushion. We do it with a very basic estate plan to make sure that if something were to happen to you, the people that you love would not be up a creek. Mm -hmm. um, and the fifth on the list is you got to figure out some way to give back um, mm -hmm. that is meaningful to you. Because although we know that more money doesn't necessarily buy more happiness once you've achieved this level of comfort, um, giving back absolutely does. Mm -hmm. You were talking about... Um the five. The, the, well, yeah, the five and the first one was the making a living. And you said making a decent living doesn't necessarily mean you're like making this, you know, all kinds of money. It's, it's just a little more than to get, to get by on a little bit. Or yeah, more you, need a, you need a, a, you need a comfort cushion, basically, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You have to be able to make some choices based on wants, not just needs. Right. Um, so uh, you know, being able to go on vacation once in a while, out to dinner in normal times once in a while, mm -hmm. um, spending some money for things that are enjoyable, not mm -hmm. just, but once you get beyond that, once you've achieved that level of comfort, there is a, a bounty of research that shows that more money doesn't buy more happiness. Right. And, and 
also that led to part of your book where you talk about uh, being paid what you're worth. And that is a, a really tough thing for women. And you, you it touched is. on that as well. Yes. Yeah. In the book, we've got a ton of, of negotiating strategies to, to help you get paid what you're worth, to help you figure out what you're worth. But um, yeah, it, it can be a very difficult thing to ask for more money for you. Mm-hmm. We, we are able to ask for our companies. We're able to ask for our children. We're able to ask for our causes. But when it's for us, somehow it just feels icky. Mm -hmm. And we got to get beyond that. Um, And the nice thing is it gets easier with practice. Mm -hmm. Um, So you just, you know, you just step up, you do it, you take a deep breath and you you put on your big girl pants and you do it. And then Mm -hmm. the next time you have to do it, it is a little bit easier. Each time. Yeah. And there Mm -hmm. was also a difference between being under, underpaid and underemployed. Was that? Under earning. Under earning, yeah. Yeah, so uh, some people are chronic under earners um, and, and they're, they, they don't earn as much as they could. They wish they earned more. It, it's, not, it's not working in a profession that you love that just happens to be a little bit lower paying. That's okay. not necessarily under okay. earning. But if you work for yourself, if you have a small business and you haven't raised your rates, in years, despite the fact that you know rates are going up around you, you should be raising your rates. You're just afraid for whatever reason, or you think you don't deserve it. That's under earning. Okay, because I was a teacher, and I certainly felt underpaid. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yes, and I would say, you know, I would say profession. teachers are absolutely one hundred percent underpaid. Whether they're under earners or not is more individual. Right. It, it, when you were a teacher, you couldn't just go in and ask for a raise. It was like, this is the number of years of right. service. Yeah. Right. And maybe so you could go get a master's, that, right? right? And then you could get paid a little bit more. Right. Right. Yeah. So for the women listening that might be single for the first time and really not, they let their husbands do a lot of the work of mm-hmm. savings and it all seems overwhelming to them. What could be the first kind of baby step into investing in themselves, what would you suggest? So if you've got a 401k or another retirement account that's yours, you are already investing. Um, And I think the first step is to just engage with that account because it's already set up for you. You don't have to do anything. You can look at how the money's invested. You can read about the investments that you have. You can get on the phone and you could talk to the, uh, somebody at the place that administers that plan. Usually they have free financial advisors that are available to you. And you could just start to have a conversation and get an education that way. Um, if, you, uh, if you've already done that and you wanna do something else, you can open a discretionary brokerage account. You, you know, if you want to try to um, buy a stock, buy an index fund, buy a mutual fund, you, you can open a, an account with any broker on the planet. Um, and, and you can just sort of dip a toe in the water. And, and as you do it, read about it, learn about it. Um, I mean, we've got a very active um, private Facebook group at hermoney.com. I know you've got one as well, and we'll have to, we'll have to cross pollinate, but (laughs) um, ours is filled with women, thousands of them who help each other with their money questions. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, you want to talk about, well, should I open an account here or there? These women have your back. Mm, That's great. And we'll have a link to that Facebook group Mm -hmm. on our show notes for the women who are listening, who want to join that. Cause I think that's a great resource again Mm -hmm. for, Oh, it, it is. Yes. And also in your book, I mean, which I recommend to people, I downloaded it, but I really recommend getting a hard copy because I want, I'm going to have to order a hard copy because I want to go back and make notes Aww. and find out like the different places, the different advice that you give, but you get, there's advice on getting your children to launch because this is our age. We mm-hmm. both have children in our 20s, Colleen and I do. Yes. And one is launching better than another one <laughs> of mine. But I think yeah, we all have that. I think that one tends to fly. And... To launch a little better. And in and, and her book, she addresses like a, fa- uh, a woman that had children that gave them a certain amount. You, you, you can tell it better than I can. But <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think there are a lot of different ways to get your kids mm-hmm. to launch. And I think, again, I, I'm, I'm conscious right now of right. being right. 
hypercritical. I think, um, I, I don't think I'm ever hypercritical, but I just think right now, our kid, I have two kids in my 20s, in their 20s, and, and there's, you know, everybody that age or, or a, a huge number of people that age are, is struggling. Mm -hmm. um, because they're, they're the low man on the totem pole in all of these companies. Um, they're working from home in jobs that they haven't had for very long. It's mm -hmm. just, it's really, really difficult. And so, um, y yes, we want our kids to, to launch. We've got, I got a lot of information in the book about figuring out, you know, are you helping too much? Um, are you, are you, um, not giving them the, the, amount of space that they need in order to fly financially on their own. But um, uh, right now, I just, I like, I just, I, for this generation, for the millennials, I just, you got to feel for them. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I Absolutely. mean, we, we had little minor things back in the 90s, like some job setbacks then, but it's mm -hmm. nothing like it is now for, for these kids, especially mm -hmm. last year's college graduates. Oh, I no just, way. Oh, that's exactly. just terrible. But her book also touches on uh, just investments, the part about your home or if you want to buy a vacation home, because, you know, my husband and I have never been into that. What were you going to say, Colleen? I was going to say, um, with, with the vacation home, one of our listeners, we had posted something in the Facebook mm -hmm. group asking our listeners some questions. And one of them actually asked, is it a wise investment to buy a vacation home that you can use as a rental property when yeah. you enjoy it? It can be. Absolutely. I mean, you just have to realize what you're getting into. Um, as far as the maintenance of that vacation home, right? Are you going to take care of it yourself? Are you going to be the one that somebody calls if something breaks? Are you going to hire somebody uh, to manage it for you? Um, and then when you've got a rental property, there are very specific tax rules about how much time you can spend there and how that impacts how the property has to be treated as an asset. But I, I think, look, I, I, um, I think that, that it, it can be a, a fantastic thing to do, mm -hmm. um, especially if you are looking at a place where you think, okay, maybe I want to spend more time there down the road, but I'm going to buy it now while interest rates are so low. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just, I think you've got to approach these things as part of a part of a plan. On the flip side, I mean, my husband and I, we do have a, um, we have a house in New Jersey that we've had now for almost 10 years. And we, we go all the time. Um, we, we don't rent it out. We go every weekend. But the question that we get asked um, but from friends is, well, aren't you sick of it? Like, don't you want to go somewhere else? Um, and quite frankly, in the summer, I absolutely don't want to go anywhere else. But um, if you were the type of person who does want to go somewhere else and for whom not going somewhere else is going to be really disappointing, then I would say don't buy a vacation home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Spend I'm, I'm in the latter part. Yeah. yeah, I'm <laughs> in the latter part. <laughs> and mine is a maintenance issue, a personal maintenance. Like, okay, I'm trying to keep up with the home I live in is enough for right. me. But yeah. I know other people, that's what they like. They like the same place to go to and that's great for them. But I, I like that too. What else was there? Colleague? I was going to say there, but I'm just going through some of the listener <laughs> questions. Um, you know, this is a question I think so many people ask, and it's not e always easy to answer because it's dependent on your financial history. But um, we got to, how much savings is enough when we retire? So I have some benchmarks um, okay. and I will tell you what they are. Um, but I should also just caveat them. I, I didn't develop them. The ones that I, I um, typically uh, tell people about are ones that were developed by Fidelity, but many financial institutions have a version of the same. Um, when I've posted these on Twitter, I have gotten creamed because um, they if you're not saving right now, they sound huge and unobtainable. But if you can get yourself to the point where you are saving that 15%, they're completely attainable. So, so just with that caveat, um, typically if you can save one times your annual income by the time you're 30, three times by the time you're 40, six times by the time you're 50, 
eight times by the time you're 60 and 10 times by the time you retire, you'll have enough to, when um, combined with social security, replace about 80% of your pre-retirement income over 30 years. And just one other thing about these guidelines, they were developed for people who make between $50,000 and $300,000 a year. Um, the more money you make, the less of your money Social Security is going to replace. Um, so it, it's just, just something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. oh, but you great... don't ever have to replace your own savings rate. So that's something to keep in mind too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with the social security age changing, like to get, isn't it like 70% if you do 67, but if you can go to 72 or three, you get. I think it was a 70 no, it's, it's, and a it's, um, it's, uh, if you take social security, what we, what we're trying to get people to do is avoid taking social security at age 62, because for every, um, additional year you wait until age 70, you get a bump in your benefits of about 8%. And that's huge. It's guaranteed mm -hmm. and it's huge. Yeah. If you're married, especially if you're married to somebody who's either a lot older or a lot younger than you, or who earns a lot more or a lot less than you, the calculation gets more complicated and you should, <laughs> you should go online and you should use a, a social security calculator to figure it out. Um, yeah, I, yeah, that is so interesting. I was a, an elementary teacher in Kentucky and a public, when I taught at a private school, but when I went to the public school, they no longer took social security out of our check and we went to the teacher retirement pension. Fund. Yeah. Well, I left, my husband moved where we live now in Tennessee. I quit teaching. I moved. I took, they were having some issues in Kentucky. So I took that money and put it in an IRA. And there is a rule that I can't even get, like, I can't get any social security. Now I have to check now that I took it out of the pension fund, but I can't get his social security either as a public school teacher, even though I paid into it when I was a public, when I was a private school teacher, when I worked other jobs before I was a teacher, even though I paid in, I don't get any of that. Now it might be different since I took it out. So I've got to check that, but that's something a lot of people aren't aware of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Teachers that pay or it, any state workers that don't pay in social security, not only do they not get any money that they previously paid in, they don't get their spouse's money. Now I'd much rather have my spouse's <laughs> social security than what I got in teacher retirement. Yeah. I think anybody who hasn't looked at their social security account, who hasn't gone to socialsecurity.gov, set up an account and figured out what is coming their way should, should absolutely do this because there are a lot of misunderstandings about the system. You're totally right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Kind of that leads us into the last question we had from one of the listeners, and that is that she has been maxing out her 401k contributions for decades, but she never checks her monthly statements. And she wants to know, should she be checking those? And should she be concerned with maybe changing up some of her investments so it's not all going into her 401 well, the question is, where is it going in her 401k? So if she's putting it in just the 401k is the bucket, mm -hmm. but once it's in the bucket, you have to invest it. So my question back to her is, how much is going into stocks? How much is going into bonds? How much is sitting in cash? And does that mix still make sense for your age and your risk tolerance? My hope is that she put it all into a target date retirement fund, that she was defaulted into a target date retirement fund if she didn't choose that on her own. Um, and if that is the case, then she didn't have to do anything. Okay. But, um, but I would look at it every, you know, once a quarter. Yeah, great. Well, that's volatile. I think a lot of people will just get the envelope and put it down. Yeah, I don't yeah and you wanna... know what, sometimes, yeah. that's, sometimes that's better. Yeah, if you're going through so much mentally, yeah. Maybe that's just too much stress to add to it. But, well, uh, yeah. 
we want the listeners to know to listen to your podcast, Her Money, mm-hmm. to go on your website because your website has blogs and links and re- you know some of the great resources on there too, to just let people know if you have questions about college funds, if you have questions about retirement, you've got some great resources on there as well. Mm-hmm. So we would, we'll have all of that linked to the show notes, but we would definitely say to you, you know utilize that, listen to the podcast. Um, Thank you for sharing. And get the book. Get the yes, book, everyone. Get the book. Yes. Because, you. yes, because, you know, there's other topics we didn't even get to touch on, but taking care of aging parents. Yes, it's in the, the book. So. The, in the book. Mm-hmm. And I, I just, you know, the part about you had information on who to look up if you wanted someone to care for your parents, things that uh, my parents have both are already passed, but things that would have been very helpful and uh, mm-hmm. things that I want my children to know. So make Thank sure you take a look at her book. I appreciate it. Thanks, Bridget. Thank, Thank you, you, Colleen. Thank you so much for Thank your you time. Thank you so much. Really sure. appreciate it. Yeah. My pleasure. We want to thank Jean Chatsky so much for being on our show with such great advice. And like I said, I'm a big fan of her book, uh, Women with Money. So I would suggest that you get it. I listened to the audio book. I downloaded it. And now I'm buying the hard copy because I really do want to point out and take notes uh, in there to have it easy to find uh, just all the information that she shared in there. And make sure that you listen to her podcast too, um, Her Money. Uh, it's a great podcast and she has, you can always write in questions to her as well. And we will have all of her information on our show notes. Um, so you can always check out, go on there, read her blogs, read about her story. It's really great. Absolutely. And I think she just gave us so much useful information. Mm-hmm. And remember that we try on this podcast to talk about anything and everything to do with midlife Mm -hmm. and beyond. So always look back to what our other shows are about. Mm -hmm. You don't want to miss any of them because we really try to just run the gamut. So if, you know, whatever podcast platform you're on, check out our other episodes. We have tons of them. If you like one, we would greatly appreciate you writing a review for it. It gets the algorithms to show that episode and our other episodes to more women in midlife. And that's really what we're trying to do is spread the word of Mm -hmm the podcast of women in midlife to be seen and heard. And we're just trying to get, you know, scream it as loud as we can. So that would be appreciated as well. Um, Follow us on all forms of social media. And if you have any questions, please uh, email us at Mm -hmm. hotflashescooltopics at gmail.com. Check out our website. Gosh, so much stuff, right? Check Facebook, and YouTube, YouTube, Pinterest, everything. We're going to try to, most of our episodes, we're going to try to show on YouTube. Sometimes that doesn't always happen because one of us, me, might be in a car. <laughs> the internet connection <laughs> might be really bad while we're recording. So, you know. If I have lipstick get, on, that means we're getting ready for we're YouTube. ready for, <laughs> yes, for YouTube. I will remember that. Yeah. Oh, Colleen's wearing lipstick. lipstick. Okay. I'll get ready. Lipstick. Okay. (laughs) So have a great week, guys, and we will talk to you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye.